Well, this time, 35 years ago, Ireland was utterly convulsed by the 1981 hunger strike. Five years earlier, the British government had withdrawn special treatment for paramilitary prisoners. This led to a series of protests within the jails, culminating in the 1981 hunger strike, a tense standoff between British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher and Republican prisoners. And before the summer had ended, 10 men had died on hunger strike. And the prison appears to be back at square one. The British government have said they won't concede political status and the prisoners in their statement today have repeated their intention of fasting to the death in order to obtain it. They want their violence justified. It isn't and it will not be. Church leaders and politicians in Northern Ireland have appealed to people to remain calm and not be influenced by predictions of impending trouble over the hunger strikers. Out in the streets, H-Block supporters were distributing propaganda and feeding a world press clamouring for news. Blessing from the balcony of his private apartments overlooking St. Peter's Square, the Pope said the people of Northern Ireland were living in a potentially explosive situation. IRA hunger striker Bobby Sands is said to have lapsed into a coma. His mother says he's dying and she's appealed to people to stay calm and not get involved in any fighting. In the last hour, the news has filtered through to this community that Bobby Sands has died after 66 days of hunger strike. Bin lids have been bashed, car horns have been sounded to alert this community to the fact that Bobby Sands has died. I would be very surprised if this doesn't mark the beginning of the end of English rule in Ireland. Quite simply, this is one of the biggest political funerals in the history of Ireland. Four prisoners have taken their own lives deliberately to give political status. It would be tantamount to giving some people a license to murder innocent men, women and children. Well, 10 prisoners in all died and all around Ireland, villages, towns and cities came to a standstill for the massive funerals. Along the way, Bobby Sands was elected to Westminster. Two more IRA prisoners were elected to the Dáil. And as you heard there, the Pope made an intervention when on the 12th of May, the second man to die in the hunger strike was Francis Hughes. And his brother, Oliver Hughes, is joining me live here this morning. Thank you very much for coming, Oliver. The third man to die was Raymond McCreesh. His brother, Malachy, is also here. Here, Malachi, thank you very much for being here. And the seventh man to die was Kevin Lynch. And Kevin's brother, Gerald, is also joining us. Thank you all very much for coming in here live to me on this Sunday morning. First of all, let's go back and talk about your families growing up. Oliver, tell me about your family, where you grew up and the kind of family you were. Well, Marion, first of all, thank you for having me on your programme. And I have to say, listening to those news flashes during the hunger strike and after it brings back a lot of very, very sad memories. And it's today it's more difficult for me to talk about it than it had been 35 years ago. Now, our family background was typical of any rural family. Uh, we come from a small farming background. Father and mother and ten children, six girls and four boys. And uh, we were a very happy family. Uh, I suppose we come from a Republican background. At least we supported the idealism of republicanism. And uh, we suffered the same abuse as any other nationalist family. Uh, intimidation from security services, discrimination in jobs, housing, justice. And uh, we supported the civil rights campaign. And uh, we done everything as would be expected from people who were best described as oppressed people. Uh, our family then broke up over a number of years. Some went to England, some went to Scotland, and uh, the younger members of the family were at home, including my own brother Francis, who was the second youngest. And he himself was a subject of a lot of abuse from the security services. Uh, if he went to football matches, he was pulled in along the road, held, the game was over. If they didn't do that, they stopped them coming home from matches. But nobody was treated any differently. And this was more or less the code of conduct of these people who were answerable to no one. One night coming from a dance in our bow, him and a friend, they were stopped along the road by the UDR. They were given an awful beating. And my father discovered Francis the next day. Couldn't get out of bed. Very seriously hurt. And uh, my father wanted Francis to go and see a solicitor and make some protest about it. Francis said that he wouldn't be doing that. He would sort this out in his own good time. And the rest is history. 
And you think, Oliver, that's probably what, you know, was the spark that got him to join the IRA. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. We'll come back to that. Raymond, your family, we were hearing there about the Hughes. Tell me about your family, where you grew up. Uh, my brother Raymond was born in February 1957. He would have been uh, the seventh uh, child born to my mother and father, uh, James and Susan McCreesh, who would have uh, came to our current village, a home of Camelot from about 10 miles away in uh, Collyhanna, Dorsey area. Uh, there was four children born before they moved uh, to Camelot. My father had obtained a job as a bin lorry driver with the local Rural District Council at that time, so it was the job was, was in Uri or at least in that area, so that, that's why they moved. And Raymond, uh, there was four of us born in Camla. I say Raymond, uh, the family eventually became a family of eight, five boys and three girls. And my sister was uh, youngest sister was born in 1960. You know, as, as Oliver has portrayed, we were just a normal family there as well. You know, the uh, my mother and father. Uh, probably like all other parents around that time, you know, the, their main emphasis in her was putting everything into raising their children. You know, education mm -hmm. was a big thing. You know, they were trying to to make sure we we kept going in the education because probably from their own lives they were all very clever individuals, but you know they never had the opportunities to to go to go forward. Uh, coming from. Uh, the farming background, you know, my my father and would always had he the he did a little bit of land that he just a field, you know, and he mm -hmm. potatoes he'd do, he'd pigs, everything just close, to, you know, he'd be out the road a little bit from us. So the 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 upbringing that we had and uh, what Raymond was uh, brought into was a very idyllic situation. We, if ever anyone has uh, had the opportunity to be around my village of Camden, that whole area, like uh, we have mountains all around us, you know, Sleep Gully and the, the, our own local Camden mountain. The mountains of Morn are just very visible from, from our house. We, Raymond would have had the freedom of that whole, that was his play area, you know, as it was for all of us, you know, the local uh, farmers, no problem whatsoever. A bunch of young lads or young girls going up into the fields, throwing down a few uh, goal posts or markers or jumpers or whatever, playing football. Uh, that was the situation they found themselves in. I, one thing I would say, I do remember clearly the day my brother was uh, came home as a baby to the house. You know, it might seem strange. I was only four myself, probably coming on five, but I remember clearly uh, my brother, my younger brother at that time, had his arms up. Uh, stretched, asking my mother, let me hold the dolly, you know, let me hold the dolly. And uh, I asked him yesterday, it was OK if I, if I, if I mentioned that on, on the radio. Oh. But but I said, that's the sort of uh, situation my brother uh, was, you know, I said, just a normal family. Uh, went, went to school in the local primary school just down the road from us. Uh, but made, he was a very... Uh, Easy person to make friends. He's, he's very good natured, you know. And he, friends that he made in his very short life remain very loyal to him, you know, over the years. And he went to, you know, from to grammar school. He passed 11 plus. He went to uh, St Coman's College in Uri. He, I think things were starting to develop at that time. He played football at a local football club, Carra Cropping, and like George's uh, brother. Uh, he didn't manage to make an All Ireland in 2016, but he made a, he made a, a, an Armagh County medal at, uh, at football mm. at under 16. He went from St Coleman's College. I don't think he was too good at. He was very he was a very clever individual, and he never actually made through. The, he ended up he, he did a, a a course in fabrication, and he ended up in in a company. I'm not sure if I can mention the name of the company, but the okay, company it was Gamble Sims. They were very good to them. Uh, it was steel fabrication. He was very good at it, and I always remember uh, coming home one Christmas, probably with a big hamper full of him. He was delighted with himself, you know, and mm -hmm. things, you know. And I say he was a, he was a very sharp person, you know. But but at that time, thing as Oliver has already outlined, you know, the circumstances of uh, what the uh, the communities were facing, you know, young people growing up, young men and and women, you know, were just. Uh, Every evening on, on the television screens, we're seeing the uh, what was going on, and you have to remember, it was the British Army, thirty thousand troops in the north at that time. You know, in recent wars, uh, throughout you know the Iraq and, and Afghanistan, there's only a couple of thousand, you know, that they committed to, it. and and I'm only talking about the British Army, you know, mm -hmm. not to mention the RUC and, and all those other aspects of it. And just to get it back from the three of you, Gerald, tell me about. Your Kevin was your brother Kevin, and tell me about your family, where you grew up, and the kind of family you were. Yeah, <coughs> well, 
we were born in, or most of us in, we were born in a little village called Park uh, in County Derry. Uh, we moved uh, to Dungiven uh, when Kevin was about three, uh, I think, and we lived there for a while. And then my father actually bought a pub uh, and he renovated it, done quite well. A big singing lounge up the stairs and dancing lounge downstairs and big darts room and what have you. So we all worked in the bar to try to help and do our best. And uh, my father was a builder as well, uh, come from a farming community. And uh, yeah, we, we worked away. Kevin, when he was a young lad, like all the rest of the lads, he played football, hurling, done a bit of boxing, sometimes outside the ring as well. But uh, that was the way it was. But he was, like all the rest of the boys, he got a, a lot of harassment uh, from the Crown Forces. And uh, he went to England when he was uh, about 16. He was a big, strong lad for his years. And uh, then he started to play. He went over to my uh, brothers in England and uh, played football over there, played hurling as well. But he had done very well, but he, he was always yearning to come home. He, he would always come home every year, you know. Uh, he was only over for a few years anyway, but uh, he would always come back and forward. And there was always intimidation and, and um, you know, brutality, shall we say, if you want of a better word. But I remember one time um, when Kevin was coming home, there was, uh, you know, the, the trouble in full flow. And... Uh, my mother had said to him to come up when he was down training. Uh, the team were doing quite well and they asked him to come back to help them. And uh, he was walking up home, maybe half a mile from the pitch up to the house, and there were two jeeps, uh, paratroopers come up and jumped out and, and they left him unconscious lying on the, on the ground. This happened a few times and the same uh, as... Francis and them, uh, Raymond as well, uh, uh, they were coming home from dances one night, and or a particular dance, there was a car load of the lads, and their UC stopped them, and they did threaten to shoot them, and, and uh, probably would have done. And uh, there was a car come up with another guy and his girlfriend, and he wouldn't leave till the guys got away. Or there quite a good possibility they would have been killed that particular night. Mm. So, history's history, he, he joined up. And uh, and that was it. So, and you were talking earlier, Oliver, about that that moment. You think when Francis was uh, beaten up by the EDR, that that was the spark that got him to join the IRA. When did your parents become aware? Was it when they first went to prison? I mean, can you remember those moments? Were they the moments when your parents thought, "Oh, they're definitely he, Francis is definitely involved here"? And what was that like? Well. Francis uh, joined the IRA when he was 17, 18 years of age and uh, it wasn't long after that till he was involved in active service and uh, some job went somewhat wrong that he was identified and he had to go on the run and he would have been on the run for four or five years till he was shot at, at a very serious shooting in the Glen Sheen Pass area of County Derry and that shooting a British officer, an SA officer, Captain Jones, was shot dead. Francis was seriously wounded. But uh, getting back to when my parents knew, my parents were quite aware over four or five years, and it was a very, very worrying time uh, whenever he was on the run, because uh, if there was an incident, they didn't know whether he was involved in it, or if he was, was he safe? Did he get away, or whatever? And our house was searched quite often. My father, if there was an incident in the area, my father used to say don't lock the front door for the lonely d hammer it in. And the door was left open for the, for the Brits to come in and search the house. But it was a terrible, terrible worrying time for the family, um, particularly in mother, mother and father. I suppose the only thing that helped my mother, she was quite religious and uh, she believed a lot in prayer and it pulled her through. So, very, very worrying time and Whenever Francis was ar eventually arrested, it might seem surprising, but it was a relief for us to know for once where he was at. And uh, while he was in prison, 
We hoped and thought nothing worse could happen to them, mm. but it was all ahead of us. And in the case of Raymond, your brother Malachi, when did he first go to prison and your parents became aware? Of I, what I he think, was you know, uh, all, the night he was actually captured would have been the time that we would have all have uh, realised that Raymond actually was involved. You know, uh, we think. Uh, the bloody Sunday shooting in Derry, whatever, had a, a massive impact on and not just Raymond, but a lot of young men and women around there at the time. My brother, Brian, who's a priest, had already suspicions that he was involved, you know, from events that had happened, you know, where Raymond had come to him one night, you know, saying that he had been arrested and different things. But the night that he was of the shooting, where he was actually involved in a, an attack on a, on a an undercover uh, British Armed Paratrooper lookout post just up the road from the house, you know, just fields away from where he would have played himself. Uh, the the operation obviously went wrong, you know, from their aspect, in that the the, uh, the soldiers were aware of their presence and they, they pulled in reinforcements and eventually were forced to uh, take cover. They got into the house and through through different aspects. Uh, managed to, to to get out of that house, you know, with the help of local priests and even local RUC men, I think, you know, or maybe. But uh, I personally w w had heard the shooting, you know, it was, it was something, and I, I didn't even think of it, but uh, about 10.30 that night, I was walking down the street, and a lady's uh, neighbours coming home from Bingo, and I, I can still remember the ladies. Um, Saying uh, per we Remy, you know, and I'm saying well, you know that was my first indication that he was involved in in what had after happened, and then she had indicated that they thought he was actually shot dead at at the thing, and you know, uh, the events on the next few hours, ever I found out, you know, went to, to my parents, and they were both in bed at the time, and I I didn't say anything until I until I got full understanding what had happened, you know, and by the time we actually. Uh, a couple of hours later, we realised they were actually in custody in RUC station in Bestbrook, and that's what I, well, I told the parents in between. You know, when I realised he was, he was still alive. Whatever, I was able to tell them, and that, that was our first uh, indication that he that he was involved in in, in uh, the IRA at that time. And in relation to Kevin, well, Kevin, he was arrested, uh, and he, he, he was home uh, from England. He was stopping with mom, my mother and father. And the early hours of the morning, there was a bang on the door, and uh, the place was saturated with RUC and army and whatever, and went up and dragged them out of bed and uh, pulled them down the stairs. He tried to put on some clothes, but uh, we, my father, he said he's going nowhere without a, a cup of tea. And this brave RUC officer, he said, uh, he's not getting a drink of water, he said. So they took him away, took him to uh, Castle Ray, and the torture began there. And uh, I remember Kevin telling me, uh, while he was in Castle Ray, that uh, in one particular time there, uh, there were six detectives around him. They'd stripped him naked, and uh, the things they were doing to him, that was was unreal. Um, they had, if I can say it, yeah. uh, um, they had uh, one detective. Uh, well, they were holding them down, arms and legs, and beating them as well. And one detective had uh, his two testicles, and he was rubbing rubbing them around one another. And I uh, actually asked him. I said, "Were they were they rough?" And he said, "No." He said, "Was the complete opposite. They were very very gentle." And he said, "I thought my stomach was going to." Bust, he said, you know, mm. and uh, he said, this went on. You get to a stage where you you pass out, and uh, but this kept occurring and keep going and going and and that was the type of, of stuff that went on. Apart from the physical beatings with fists and boots and everything else, you know. So they all ended up in Long Cash. Oliver, at what stage did you realise? Did you hear that Francis was going on hunger strike? Well, Francis, after the shooting incident on the Glenshane Pass, he was taken to uh, Musgrave Park Military Hospital where he spent most of a year. And <clears throat> the, the day that we got word of the shooting, which was on it was the 17th of March, uh, I was told and I delivered the message to my mother and father. It was difficult to give them that message 
uh, but however they handled it quite well and there, we were then given a visit into Musgrave Park Hospital on a Sunday and uh, myself and my father and my uncle and Kevin a new solicitor got in to see him well there's a funny side to this too and it's just typical of the type of person Francis was I mean apart from being a very 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 good person he was a character in every sense so Kevin Agnew, the solicitor and myself were allowed in first and whenever we went into the wee bedroom where he was lying there was two policemen one on each side of him and Francis' leg was up in a, a sling and so I said Francis how are you? Oh he says I'm not so bad and the next thing he said and I have to say to my embarrassment he says how many did I get? <laughs> so I tell you something, I didn't know where to go in front of the three policemen, how many did I get? But whoever, he stayed there for a year, was charged and eventually sentenced and went to Long Cash and joined the protest. And then I got a message out from some time, months later, that he wanted to see me. Now I had, but there was a rumour going around, there was a hunger strike planned and I assumed that that's what it was. So I went in and I had a visit with him. We talked about everything. Hunger strike never was mentioned about five minutes before the visit was up. He said, there's a hunger strike coming off. And he says, I'm number two. And he says, I don't want you to speak or try to get me off it. He says, that's the way it is. And I want you to give me your total support. And when I went to a coma, I don't want anybody to interfere. I, I was just lost for words. I, I couldn't speak and I just nodded my head in agreement. And he says, maybe by my death other people will live. Maybe this will bring about a change that we cannot get through other ways. So I come out of the cell and shake hands with him and I sat in the car and I was quite emotional for a long time because I knew the consequences of his decision. He was a very brave, determined person. He was not going to give up uh, on hunger strike unless the demands were met. And he was up against one of the, the greatest criminals of all time, the greatest murderer of all time, Margaret Thatcher, who wasn't going to give any way. Some of her, some of her boys got wrote off here and she was looking blood and sadly she got it. So I come home and told my mother and father what the situation was and uh, it was more difficult for me to tell them than for them to hear it. They handled it quite well. So sadly there was other people to join that hunger strike and those families had to suffer the same pain as well. And Raymond in your case, how did you hear? Well, that um, Raymond was going on at Malachy. When Raymond uh, obviously was arrested, you know, he was on remand in Crumlin Road Jail for I think it was nine months, you know, before his trial where he was he was sentenced to 14 years in prison for conspiracy. And so when he went to the, the H blocks, you know, that was at, in the Crumlin Road, we were able to visit him, you know, to, I think it was three times per week and the normal neighbours would be visiting, our family would be visiting. But when he went to... Uh, the H blocks, you know, the, as you outlined at the start of the program, the uh, in June of '76, the British government had selected an arbitrary date to say the prisoners that will be captured from this point on will be treated differently, and that's where the uh, the protests within the H blocks itself uh, uh, took place. Now Raymond would not. He would not take any visits while he was there. He was there for four years and he wouldn't wear the uniform to come out to, to meet the family. My brother, Brian, who was a priest, did manage to say Mass in, in the, the area that Raymond was at one time. And uh, when they found out, you know, he wasn't allowed to, to do it anymore. But So there was no communication with us other than what... Uh, all the prisoners were able to write little comms, you know, on, mm. on tissue paper, uh, which are very effective over, and, you know, the number of people around our area would have received those, you know, from uh, good supporters uh, through the whole... But that, what I'm leading up to is that uh, 
whenever Raymond was on the first hunger strike, he joined the first hunger strike in 1980. At the end of it, you know, he, he didn't know it was the end of it when they were joining it. But as I, I mentioned to people before, selflessly, I, from my own perspective, I said, well, God, you know, surely before we reach him, you know, it will be solved or resolved. Unfortunately, the, uh, the, the 1980 hunger strike ended the way it did, you know, the, there was always a, a, the chance that uh, another one would take place. In uh, February, uh, I had my mother and father down on a visit to meet him, and that would be for the first time. I said my brother Brian was the only one I'd seen him from, from he, he'd been uh, sentenced, and we went in to see him, and th that was that was what he was there for. He was there to tell us he was going on hunger strike. <coughs> but the person that came out to meet us uh, was long-haired, a bird unrecognisable to, to ourselves and as my mother said after after the visit she said I didn't know him except for his his, uh, his teeth and his smile you know and the humour was still well you know and his humour you know he was still the strong uh, good humour individual but he, he more or less uh, told us at that point that he was going to go on the hunger strike you know that they had they had done all they could to actually highlight their, their problem that, that suffered great inhumanity I think from a family perspective, although we know that they were in those hitch blocks for all those years, we were on the streets protesting, and there was lots of things happening, but we, even as a family members, you could not even uh, ever think you would actually dis understand the suffering that, that those prisoners uh, went through dur in that, during that period. And yeah. Kevin, when did you hear that Kevin was going on? Well, I had a visit with Kevin uh, about a year before. Uh, and I was very close with Kevin. Well, we all were, but, you know, we grew up more or less together. And uh, he said to me on that particular visit that they were thinking of going on a hunger strike. And uh, obviously we knew the consequences because other guys had done it earlier to get, to, you know, to get the political status way back down the, ca down the case, you know. And, um, but anyway, my mother and father went up. I think Patsy O'Hara might have just died at that particular stage and they, they went up to see him on a visit and uh, Kevin told them that particular day that uh, he was going on it. Of course my father was a big strong man and he says no you're not and uh, Kevin he said to me mother he says I never needed you more than I need you now and he put his two hands <coughs> around my mother's hands and, and he says I need your your help here please side with me so she gave him her word that uh, she would do that and she never broke it she, both my mother and father were very strong the whole way through they had went to see everybody uh, tried like everybody else to save their loved ones lives and um, you know uh, uh, Thatcher wasn't for for turning. She wanted her as as uh, Mr. Hughes says here. A, she wanted her point of flesh, and uh, that was it. And just because we're going to obviously get to the part now where they lose their lives in a hunger strike, but I'm conscious also, I suppose, of people listening, perhaps screaming at their radio, saying, "Miriam, ask them." Oliver, I suppose your brother ended up in Long Cash on hunger strike because he went out and he took the lives of other people and they would say anything that happened to him is his own fault and his own responsibility because he murdered other people. What would you say to that? Funny, once, one time ago I was talking to a very senior politician in the south who shall remain nameless and he said your hunger strike was your... 1916. It was, he says, no different, absolutely not. We had volunteers here in 1916 who joined up and fought the British and uh, lost their lives. Some of them were executed. Units were in a similar situation in the north where the brutality that was being levelled against you and of course we all know there's a long history of conflict in Ireland going back 800 years. And I hope that the end that conflict is over forevermore. But in our case, we had to endure and suffer the consequences of that war. Uh, we felt at that time we had no alternative. 
Now, we would probably see things in a different light today. But at that time, we thought there was no alternative. In the incident that Francis was shot, he was seriously wounded. British soldiers were seriously wounded, and one of them died. So all's fair in war. But it, it wasn't a simple matter of, I'll join the IRA and go to war. There had to be a lot of thought. Francis was a thinker. He was capable of making up his own mind. Uh, he didn't do it from position of hatred. It seemed to be the only alternative to marching on the streets, which wasn't having any effect. OK, now let's go back to the hunger strike, because that's what we are discussing today. At what stage, Oliver, did, did you get to see Francis a lot when he was on hunger strike, and, and did you get to see him towards the end of that hunger strike? Aye, we, we got, and I suppose once a week, to, on a visit, that would have not, wouldn't necessarily been always the family, because a lot of people, neighbours and relations, who wouldn't have been maybe able to get in too often, would have wanted to visit, and there was a sort of a list. But when it come up to near the end of his life, it was more or less strictly family, and uh, they were only allowed in two at any time. The day before he died, they refused to let me in, and on the day he died, they wouldn't let me in either because two people had been in. But uh, it was very, very sad, sad watching a person lying on a bed. Uh, if you compared it to a patient lying in a hospital bed where all the necessary medication is provided, all the help from medical staff, but in our case we had to say to those people, no, he must be allowed to die. That was the most difficult part of all, but we had to respect his wishes. And when he died... Believe it or not, it was a big relief for us because his pain was over. He was at peace. But sadly, when he died, there had to be eight other people come behind, including my next-door neighbour and first cousin, Thomas McElwee. So that pain went to another family and down the line. So very, 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 very hard, tough times for the families. And Raymond, in, in your case, in uh, relation to Raymond? In relation to Raymond, with regard to, you know, uh, why he got involved rather than in take a, uh, what would be considered a, a more peaceful protest type of, you know, Ray, Raymond had grown up in, in that era, as I said, he'd watched the, uh, the civil rights marchers being beaten off the street, he'd, you know, he'd watched all those things happening, and uh, from the... Uh, Alternative, you know, to them, you know, they had made that decision as as many people had made it in the past, and even in my own local village of uh, Camlock, you know, there was a man who uh, who made similar decisions back uh, almost a hundred years ago now, and that man was Frank Aikens, and he he had uh, made the decision to confront the British state at that time. He he went on to become. Uh, the tarnished in this state, he went on to become a UN spokesperson, he went on to become very involved in, in uh, the UN and issues throughout the globe, you know, so that was a man that actually, he was buried 50 yards away from my brother in the same graveyard. And then were you able to visit him when he was on hunger strike? Well, we got, we well, the same thing. We would we would have the whenever he moved to the hospital. That's when the family were able to actually go go to visit him, and we uh, we were able to at that point, you know, see as Oliver described, you go in and everything it was there. As dinners would be sitting there if you were in at that time. As meals of all were taken and moved. As, it, it was uh, a tough time to, to be in to see him uh, sitting there. You know, as I got closer to the end, uh, uh, the Sunday before he died, I was in there. You know, it allowed us to, to stay overnight. There was a lot of incidents happened with the family where they tried to actually uh, use our family to actually break the hunger strike through Raymond. You know, and there was, you know, I don't think we have time to describe it or go through it all this morning. But it was a very tough time for the family. Yeah, because they were reporting, weren't they, that in fact your family was forcing Raymond to stay on? That was, a, and that all came about, you know, actually uh, I attended the funeral of Oliver's brother Francis on a Friday and a local uh, 
journalist Eamon Malley came over to me and said uh, there's a lot of talk within the British journalists around that Raymond is going to give up the hunger strike and I said well I was in with him yesterday which was a Thursday I said he didn't say anything but I said I would be in with him tomorrow the Saturday and I'll you know what I'll, I'll, I'll ask him and uh, we had a visit with him on the Saturday with my, my brother and uh, my sister uh, this is the first thing I said I told him was at, at uh, Francis's uh, funeral and I said, Eamon Malley had said that uh, you were thinking of uh, giving up your hunger strike. And I said, Raymond, don't you feel under any pressure to remain on hunger strike? You know, if you, if you want to come off this hunger strike, you just come off it. And he reacted immediately. He said, not a chance. We've gone too far at this point. And, you know, the circumstances developed over the, um, that, that evening, you know, that... Because I, I, I say that because looking back, you know, that we we were, uh, or at least my brother Brian got a call uh, that evening at home to, to actually visit, go back to the prison, and he was more or less told to come on by himself. But we, as a family, my mother went with, I went back down again, and my, another sister, and we we actually thought Raymond had died. We assumed that he had actually taken a turn from from the Saturday afternoon, and when we went in. Uh, Without going through the whole detail, basically that said that he'd he'd, uh, he'd got uh, extra function, you know. Uh, but you know, but uh, as my brother would point out, you know, from his own, you know, the, the term wasn't even been used for the previous 15 years. It was uh, you know, the last rights, but they more or less said that he had asked for uh, for milk or something, or they had offered him milk, but. The gist of the story was we went in to visit Raymond and he didn't know where he was. You know, he said he was in a in a, a hospital in Scotland. And we said, how do you know you're in a hospital in Scotland? And he said, the uh, prison officer told me I'm in a hospital. And we know that the, that a whole elaborate uh, plan to try and uh, break Raymond. And after talking to him for a few minutes, he came back and realised where he was. Because as Oliver said, uh, we got a lot of strength from Raymond. You know, we got a lot of strength, you know, and uh, there was hope all the time that something would happen. And, you know, that was just, you know, just some of the aspects of uh, how difficult it was to be watch Raymond uh, dying in, in that room. And Gerald, of course, because Kevin was the seventh, there was, I mean, towards the end, it was that one mother, I think, with Father Fall, who took her son off and that broke it. But... There must have been huge pressure around that time on your own family, was there? Oh yes, there was. There was uh, phenomenal uh, pressure, like from all angles, especially the 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 hierarchy of the church, and. Uh, but maybe they meant well. They just wanted to save these did, young but, men's lives. Um, I think, uh, as it turned out, uh, the the British uh, government had uh, something a stranglehold on the church, and uh, that's why they were. Participating on uh, trying to break the to break the hunger strike, you know. Um, certainly, my mother and father were very religious people, uh, and uh, you know they didn't want to do nothing uh, against the church, if you understand. But anyway, that said, uh, Kevin's a very strong man, uh, very strong willed, and. Uh, I uh, just want to touch on one little thing there, just about uh, the, the meals and stuff. Um, I actually asked, uh, other members of the family had asked, but I had particularly asked if, if they could take the, the meals away. They were sitting at the bottom of the bed. I think he was well into the 50th day at that stage, or past it. And uh, anyway, they went away, they consulted, and they come back in this big screw. He come up and, and his own dignified way he said ah he probably wouldn't eat it now you know and Kevin looked at him he said I still have the desire for food the the thing was they wouldn't let them away with nothing even though they were lying on their deathbed they still had their dignity and they wouldn't have let them away with nothing and actually even in death we have a clip now actually which we're going to play which is of the funeral of your brother Oliver Francis and even then it was a big news story then for people who don't remember and uh, just when you were trying to bury him and the problems. Let's listen now to that clip. The body of Francis Hughes was released under heavy police security from the morgue. But while several thousand Catholics had gathered in Belfast to see the coffin, 
Police, fearing what they called paramilitary intervention, ordered the hearse, with Hughes' family behind, to head straight for their family home on a farm a half hour away. And when the police believed their orders were being disobeyed, they took action, yanking from the hearse its driver and the undertaker, and knocking Hughes' father to the ground. The police have offered no explanation. The hearse was escorted by another group of men in paramilitary uniform. At the bottom of the laneway, the coffin was taken out of the hearse and three volleys of shots fired over it. The cortege moved off towards the village, but a few hundred yards away came up against a police cordon, set up to prevent the procession from going through the village. Francis Hughes' brother, Oliver, registered protest with a senior police officer. This is the right that Francis went to the chapel every Sunday and every morning during the week when he went to Mass. And every one of them... Now, can you give me a reasonable explanation why we cannot go the, the traditional route, which we take every day? I'll come back to you on that, Oliver. We also have an um, archive of Raymond's funeral, Raymond Creech. So we'll take that now if you have it. Several thousand people converged on the village of Camloch to see the third dead hunger striker buried. For the last four days, his body had lain in his parents' home close by the graveyard. But this afternoon, it was taken in procession for over an hour, backwards and forwards through streets guarded by armed paramilitaries. The coffin, with its symbols of the IRA on top, paused for a short while during the procession to allow for the now familiar volleys of rifle fire. Support for the IRA is strong in this part of South Armagh, and the death of this particular hunger striker is a potently symbolic issue here. One of the coffin bearers was the dead man's brother, a Catholic priest. As the procession went into church, the only security presence was an army helicopter overhead. And we'll listen also now to the removal of Kevin, Kevin Lynch. There was violence on the streets of Belfast as news of Kevin Lynch's death spread in the early hours of today. The worst rioting was in the New Barnsley area, where more than a hundred petrol bombs and several blast bombs were thrown at the joint British Army RUC base. A number of shots was also fired. British troops and police fired plastic bullets at the rioters. The cortege arrived at Dungiven early this afternoon. The coffin was draped with the tricolour and the plough and the stars, and a berry and gloves were placed on top. The coffin was escorted by six men in paramilitary uniform who followed orders in Irish from a seventh man. The cortege then made its way to the Lynch family home. The funeral is expected to take place on Monday. For all three of you, because my time is running away, when you look back now, uh, it's something that struck me rereading da David Beresford's book, and uh, he died recently himself, David, is that they were all very young men. And perhaps if they'd grown up in a different society, at a different time, they'd have gone on to be dentists or lawyers or farmers. So it all just seems incredibly tragic. Do you think it was worth it, Malachy? Do you think it was worth Raymond losing his life on a hunger strike? Well, uh, as, as we look back, you know, obviously it's the struggle that they were, were in, you know, as I said before, you know, the circumstances was what, as you said yourself, dictated, you know, what, what, what were the, the eventual outcome for them. And I think down through history, you know, there's lots of things you, you look back. We just had our, uh, our 1916 celebrations, you know, just uh, last Sunday was, I stood outside the GPO in a very emotional gathering, you know, to be there where, where people had actually made the same decisions, or, you know, and people are, are, are still saying, was it worth it? But I think as we strive towards, you know, we're not there yet, as Oliver said earlier on, the, the circumstances are different now. You know, although there's there's people still in prison, you know, for political reasons up up north and differently, the, the circumstances are definitely there to, to actually on a, on the political understanding you know, to, to actually uh, go forward, go forward with this. So, uh, uh, watershed moment was 1981 for this generation, and I think it's similar as uh, Oliver I think as stated earlier, 1916 was. And uh, I'm not trying to compare the two, but you know, different era, different circumstances. But uh, going for it, you know, it's hard to say. You know, the question of whether it was worth it, you know, because it's, it's, it's. Uh, I, I would certainly believe that they had some bearing on where we are at this point in time. And from your point of view, Gerald, I mean, everybody, I suppose, knows the name of Bobby Sands. And I don't mean that harshly, but yeah. not everybody will know the name of Kevin Lynch. And you wonder, and I'm not going into all Richard O'Rourke's yeah. book, but you wonder, 
maybe if the hunger strike had stopped after maybe Bobby, what, was it worth it for your brother Kevin to die? And there was a lovely bit in David Beresford's book actually, where your father, your late father, apparently used to go to his grave and wash every single one of the little marble white stones on his grave every year. In other words, it was such a devastating blow for your dad. Oh yeah, well, you know, to lose a son at any any mm. anyway, but through a hunger strike, like you know, and watch the the pain and the suffering, but he he, he knew why he was doing it. Uh, the beatings, the torture, the you know the indescribable inhumanity that was going on, you know, that, that drove him on. And, and the words of Bobby saying, you know, uh, Bobby had a great quote and it said, "I have considered all of the alternatives, but the hunger strike has been forced upon me and my comrades." by four and a half years of stark inhumanity. Now I meet a lot of the the former hunger uh, not the hunger the former uh, blanket men and women and uh, even last weekend I met them and, and it was absolutely fantastic just meeting up with them. They were unbowed and unbroken as the saying goes. They come through hell and they're come out and they're and they're very, very powerful force, and it's great to meet them. I'm a very lucky man that I keep in contact with them. Last word to you, Oliver. Well, I, I think it, it should be stated that the Republican movement leadership did not want a hunger strike, but they understood the difficulties that the prisoners were experiencing. Now, when the prisoners did go on hunger strike, hunger strike the Republican leadership gave their full support to them. Now, that hunger strike is over, but Long Cash is still there. And in Long Cash today, we have a number of prisoners, quite a number, who are suffering the same situation as my brother suffered. So I just hope and pray that we will never have a hunger strike in this country again, but something has to be done to sort out Long Cash now or we will have serious consequences. OK, well, look, I just want to thank the three of you. You've travelled here to be with me here this morning. Oliver, Malachy, Gerald, thank you all very much for being my guests this morning. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Sunday with Miriam on RTE Radio 1.